Well, good morning and happy Sabbath. It's nice to see all your smiling faces this morning. <laughs> Um, this, was a pers- this was a personal request, this sermon. It's going to be another uh, uh, one in the, the line of apologetics. This was, actually, this was actually asked for years ago, and I found it because I was going through, I was going through um, some of my notes that I had placed years ago, and I wrote this down somewhere. And it was requested by Rodney years ago. So I'm going to get in contact with him, make sure he knows uh, that this got put up. So uh, sorry about the delay. But today we're going to be talking about Jesus Christ being the Son of God. Is he begotten or eternal or is he a created being? And so as we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we ask for your truth this morning. We ask for that absolute truth that is found in the Bible, in the spirit of prophecy. We ask for the strength of mind to be able to see the truth as it is in Jesus. We ask that you'd increase our faith, that we might be obedient and submissive to you in all things. Allowing, allowing you to be in control, you to be the master of our lives, to be enthroned in our hearts, to be our all in all, and not, not, in a, not in a way where you basically take possession of us, not like that, Lord, but in a way where we, we love you and we seek to honor you and we seek to make what is clearly your will our own will as well, to follow the Lamb whithersoever He goes. That is our prayer this morning and our prayer as a people. Help us in these last days to get our houses in order so that we might serve you face to face one day. In Jesus' name, amen. So, since the very beginning of the Christian church, the idea has persisted over the deity of Christ. This is what we call the incarnation, right? Jesus Christ was fully God, but also fully man. How is that possible? Shouldn't it be like a 50-50% or something, right? This has been a question. There are some that say Jesus is not God, but a God, lowercase g like a great leader or ruler, or that he was made into a God. If you look into Mormonism, they'll say that he was made into a God, and we can all become gods as well, and basically redo the, the history of the earth again in our own universe. That's what the Mormon belief is. Or some will say that he's, uh, he's a God, lowercase g, a created being, such as the false doctrine of the Jehovah's Witnesses. They say that Jesus actually is just, uh, he's actually Michael the Archangel. And Michael the Archangel, Seventh-day Adventists understand that Jesus, uh, Jesus has the, the name, which is a title, Michael. And so, yes, Jesus is Michael the Archangel, but Michael the Archangel is not a created being. Michael the Archangel is not an angel. He's an archangel, which means arch messenger. It's a big difference between the Jehovah's Witness belief in who Michael is and the SDA belief. Whereas the SDA belief understands Michael, the name is a title, which means he who is as God is. Just like Jesus' name is also Emmanuel. His name is also Shiloh in the Bible. He has many names, which are also titles. But they say, no, no, he's a created being, and then God used this angel to create everything else. That's what the Jehovah's Witnesses believe. Others say, Jesus is definitely God, capital G, but he is begotten, meaning he is the Father's first creation, or he comes from the Father, emanates from him in some way, which in turn created everything else. So Jesus actually created everything else, but he's begotten by the Father. I know this can kind of be a little confusing. 
This is more closely aligns with Arianism of the early, of early church history. And I, I say kind of closely aligns with Arianism because the fact of the matter is all the information that we have on the beliefs of the Arians come from Roman Catholic sources. So we don't really know who were Arians and who were not and who actually believed this and who didn't. But there was a big, uh, there's a big uh, schism, whatever you want to call it, in the, in the church in the early centuries of the church where you had the believers in Arianism that believed that Jesus was a created being versus those who believed that Jesus was God. And it was all settled in the Council of Nicaea. The Council of Nicaea basically stated that Jesus was God. And actually what they stated was is that Jesus was actually God the Father and the Father was Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit is God the Father, and the Holy Spirit is Jesus Christ as well. It's like a, um, the best way I can explain it, because we're talking about God here, so we can't really explain it. But what the Catholics said, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that this is what the Roman Catholic Church decided, this is not actually what is a reality, okay? But basically God is like a pie who cut himself into three separate pieces, or cloned himself, however you want to look at it, where he, where he shows himself in three different personalities as the Father, the, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But they're all one. And when we say one, we don't mean one in purpose, one in unity. We mean they're actually one. That's what the Roman Catholic Church believes. The Catholic idea of Jesus, he's God, not created, but more like a piece of the one true Godhead, of the same substance is what the phrase that they used in the Council of Nicaea. Making a God pie, which is separated into three parts or persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Today in Seventh-day Adventism and other Christian denominations, this side issue, and it is a side issue, is still prevalent even urging that the pioneers believed Jesus was a created or begotten. And also, and by the way, you got to really be careful with the, the pioneers quote from people because the pioneers grew, agreed on little, very little. That's like saying the reformers believe this. Well, the reformers didn't believe a lot in common. So the pioneers, they'll say, believe that Jesus was a created or begotten being, and it depends on who you talk to as to how far they take that. And also that the Holy Spirit is not a person who's separate and distinct. And they'll point back to the Council of Nicaea and the fact that it was a Roman Catholic teaching. But what does the Bible and the spirit of prophecy actually say about this? And also, does it matter? Does it really matter in the end? And then, uh, finally, we must understand God in the way he has chosen to reveal himself to us in his word. You know, one time... I've had, I've had folks talk to, and I'm not going to say who they were, but I've had folks talk to me privately where they said, you know, I kind of I view God more as like a, a male and female God, or as a God who's not separated into three persons, but more like an octagonal God where he can be eight. And I said, you know, I said this was a person who uh, they, they, were, they weren't, let's, let's say they, they weren't someone who read very often or anything like that. And I told him, I said, yeah, that's, uh, it's possible. You know, I mean, we're talking about God here, right? I mean, can God be eight persons? Sure, he could be a hundred persons. We don't know. But is that how God has revealed himself? Because we can't define him. He, he's defined himself to us. So what does it actually say? So let's start off with some pioneer thoughts um, to, to, the, to the point of those who say that he is begotten. This is what some pioneers actually did say. And this is from uh, the sermon, The Author and Finisher of Our Faith by Elder uh, Mick, ba uh, Mick, Mick Labard. Uh, Review and Herald, January 11th, 1881, page 229. He's talking about Jesus. He says, he is the author of our faith inasmuch as it originated with him. The doctrines, precepts, and promises of Scripture are but the radiations of the Son of Righteousness. There may have been a period when Jehovah dwelt alone in the solitude of eternity, but it is difficult to antedate, that means try to date, the existence of Christ. We know, however, that in the nature of things, there must have been a period when his sonship began. This is by no means inconsistent with the idea of his authorship 
of our faith, for he is the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, which is from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, and John chapter 1, verse 14. So they're making the argument here that the, actually what they're saying is, so I know this gets real confusing real quick. Here they're not saying Jesus is a created being, but they are saying there's a time when Jesus was not. That's what they're saying. They're saying he's begotten of the Father. So there was a time when he wasn't. Now, in our understanding, and again, we're, we're human beings. We're trying to understand God. In our, in our understanding, is Jesus eternal if there was a time when he didn't exist? Can't be eternal, right? Can't be. Like God's law is eternal. God's law is eternal whether, whether, there's, whether there's a universe or not. The law is the law. That's, those are the precepts of life. Uh, the Father, Jehovah, there's never a time when he didn't exist. Even time is created by him, so he's outside of that. He's outside, he's outside of the mechanisms that we use to measure. You know, day, night, months, days, years, any form of time that we have, any sort of, any sort of measurement that we have, they're all designed by him. He, everything that was made was made by Jesus Christ. That's what Colossians chapter 1 says. So even to talk about if there was a time, quote, time, when Jesus was not, is almost a misnomer because he's outside of time, right? The, the thing, if you, if you build a computer, the computer can only make calculations based on its software and its hardware inside that computer. It doesn't understand things outside of that unless you teach it. So it's the same thing with us. We can't really, we can't really comment on this because we don't understand. We're, we're, we're part of the program. We're the program. We're the programming that's trying to understand the mind of the person that built the computer. <laughs> that's like uh, pretty much impossible unless the, the computer designer comes in and uploads some software that says, well, this is how you can understand me. And God has done that. Uh, Paul? And what you were saying about God made time, pretty much, the Bible in two different phrases says that. Alpha and omega, from vanishing point to vanishing point. Right. From everlasting to everlasting. Vanishing point to vanishing point. Literally transmitted, translated, yes. that's what they mean. Yes. So how do you define that in our puny little brains? Yes, exactly. Yeah, we're, we're, on, we're on territory here that we really shouldn't be on. No. Right. So here's another take. And actually, this one, I'll say, you know, I think this one's a pretty solid one. I don't necessarily come to the same conclusion, but you'll see what I'm talking about. This is commentary, scripture questions from W.H. Littlejohn, page 96. Christ is not a created being, he says, but he does say he's begotten. Review and Herald, April 17th, 1883, page 250. He says, You are mistaken in supposing that Seventh-day Adventists teach that Christ was ever created. They believe, on the contrary, that he was begotten of the Father and that he can properly be called God and worshipped as such. They believe also that the worlds and everything's which, everything which is was created by Christ in conjunction with the Father. They believe, however... Now, he's trying to speak for all Seventh-day Adventists when he says this, okay? So they, that's us. They believe, however, that somewhere in the eternal ages of the past, right? Now, we're, we're using time phrases, right? We don't know what those are, but there was a point at which Christ came into existence. They think that it is necessary that God should have antedated Christ in his being in order that Christ could have been begotten of him and sustain to him the relation of a son. They hold the distinct personality of father and son, rejecting as absurd that feature of Trinitarianism, which insists that God and Christ and the Holy Spirit are three persons and yet but one person. Okay, that's what they're talking about. Seventh-day Adventists hold that God and Christ are one in the sense that Christ portrayed that his disciples might be one i.e., one in spirit, purpose, and labor. Notice he danced around. He didn't mention the Holy Spirit here. So there, there's a lot of issues going on here that I see. It's kind of a political stance that he's taking. 
He's basically being politically correct in the eyes of Seventh-day Adventists, trying to upset as few people as possible. Because th these issues weren't settled. You've got to understand, when people came into Millerism and Seventh-day Adventism, they came in from all different walks. It's, it's, not, like, it's not like other denominations, where the people came in with certain beliefs, and they basically had uh, a very similar belief system, and they built up from there. This is, this is more like when the, when the Christian church was being founded, and people from the Gentile side were coming in with pagan beliefs, and people from the Jewish side were coming in with every form of Judaism that they had, right? Which was to the very liberal Sadduceic side, to the very, uh, to the very extremely ultra-conservative, fanatical side of Phariseeism. And it was, I mean, you had a lot of unbalanced people. And so this is, this is what you got going on in early Adventism, too. You have, you got Quakers coming into the, coming into the, the message. You have... Methodist, Mrs. White, she was a Methodist. Um, you have Baptist, the, the founder, if you will. Not the, he's not the founder, but the founder of Millerism. You know, uh, William Miller, he, he was a Baptist preacher. So you have Baptist, and they all have different beliefs. Some of them seem minor, but some of them are pretty major. And one of the issues that they had was some, some Seventh-day Adventists in the, early, in the earliest parts of the movement said that Jesus actually was a created being. Others said that he was begotten. Uh, I disagree with both. I think I've made that clear already. Uh, because we're, we're trying to define God in, in, in things that are measurements that he's created. And we can't understand. When you define begotten, what do you mean by that? Begotten. Okay. Actually, it's coming up on the next slide. It's coming up on the next slide. Okay. So let's go there. Yeah, let's go there. So begotten. John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth him should not perish but have everlasting life. So there you have it. The Bible does say that Jesus is begotten. But what does that mean? In the Strong's Concordance, I looked it up. It's uh, monogenous. Monogenous, it's number 3439. It means only begotten, only, or only child. Single of its kind, only used of only sons or daughters viewed in relation to their parents. So it's your child. So you, you beget Scarlet. Scarlet is begotten from Amanda. That's, that's your child, just like my, my children, my sons, Benjamin and Marcus, they're begotten by me and my wife. And you'll see that in the, in the beginning of the Bible when it talks about when it talks about children being born, it mentions this. So it says in, uh, in Genesis chapter 4, for instance, it says, And Adam knew, knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And so gotten, kind of begotten. But if you look at the, let me, let me actually try to find some of the generations. Okay. There we go. So if we go to chapter 5 of Genesis, starting in verse 3, it says, And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image, and called his name Seth. And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. And there's many other, there's many other instances where it uses that phrase, begot or begat. And so one of the things I think that's really being missed here in this whole conversation is God is not really focused on the physical things that are going on, right? Whether Jesus is actually begotten physically by the Father. I think what is much more important here is that Jesus is the only, the only being to ever exist, especially in the human family, who was begotten spiritually by God. Meaning, Jesus was the only one who lived a sinless life. He's, only, he's the only one who can be called the truly begotten of the Father. Because even though we're all created beings and we're all, we're all God's children, spiritually speaking, we're not all God's children. Not even close. Because if we, were, if we were his children, we would be like him in character. And we haven't done that. We've all chosen sin. Even some of the greatest heroes of the Bible, like Moses, you know, even after his conversion, he struck the rock. He struck the rock when he was supposed to speak to it. He, he, he disobeyed a direct order from God. 
And so he can't be called a begotten son of God. Not in the sense we're, we're, we're begotten by adoption, but only Jesus can claim the title of truly begotten. And that's a character thing, I think, more than anything else. So here's some other begotten examples. I read this from Genesis chapter 5, verse 4. Um, and after the days of Adam, after he had begotten Seth, were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 8, it says, The children that are begotten of them shall enter into the congregation of the Lord in their third generation. And Judges chapter 8, verse 30, and it's, it says, And Gideon had threescore and ten sons of his body begotten, for he had many wives. So Gideon, unfortunately, you know, he engaged in that, but the fact of the matter is begotten means like a child. And I think begotten, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but I think begotten also represents more so a relationship that Jesus has with the Father rather than what's physically happened, either in eternal ages past or even today. Jesus, in the Bible, it says that Jesus is equal with God. He's equal with the Father. And yet, the Father didn't come down to earth uh, and, and suffer mockery and shame and die, did he? No. Jesus did that. Jesus asked permission from the Father before he came here so that he could do it. Jesus being called the Son of God, I think more so represents uh, the relationship dynamic that Jesus has with the Father. You see, in the Melchizedek priesthood, you have... You have the Holy Spirit, which is seeking to convict men here on earth and women of their sin and make them right with God. He prepares their prayers as well. Romans chapter 8 says that. Jesus is the sacrifice. He has a, they have different roles. And so Jesus' Jesus's role has been, for all time, is his role, his relationship with the Father, is to be in submission to him and obedient to him. That doesn't mean he's not equal. It's like women and men, right? The, the marriage relationship. God calls the woman to be, to be in submission when the, man is, when the man is following the law of God. Let's make that clear, okay? When the man is following the law of God, the woman is to be in submission to him. But that doesn't mean she's not equal to him. That's, what, that's the role that, that she has. Just like a man is called to, go, to fight wars, He's called to go out and earn the bread and protect the family. If someone breaks into the house in the middle of the night, you're not going to send the woman down to go fight off the attacker, right? That's ridiculous because that's the man's role. And I think a lot of, I think even today, even though society is so backwards, I think there are still many people today that would say that that would be shameful if the guy didn't try to step up, step up at that moment, right? Whereas... For a man, because that, that, that's his role. His role is to sacrifice himself for his family. His role is to, is to provide bread, water, necessities, provisions for the family. That's his role. The woman is supposed to be the homemaker, right? And so when, when we see the, revol, the roles reversed, when we see a, a man who wants to be a stay-at-home dad, I think the same thing as when I see a woman who is trying to, to, to fight in a war when there's, and, and be a part of an infantry unit. It's like, that's not what you're supposed to do. Just with the guy. You're not wired to do that. God has not called you to do that. That's not your job. So we dishonor God when we don't fall into our roles, but it doesn't mean just because the roles might be different and one might have more power in a certain context and another might have more power in another context, that doesn't mean they're not equal. Just like Jesus Christ with the Father. He's always subservient to him. He presents his blood on the mercy seat before who? The Father. But the Father is equal to him. So how is this, how is, how is this not r roles are reversed? Because that's his role. That's Jesus' role. To be the son. So the schools of thought are these. You have the Arian role, which is also the Jehovah's Witness modern day role so this is the uh it's revived ancient heresy if you will jesus is a created being but he's elevated above the rest of creation that's basically the arian belief in a nutshell and the what jehovah's witnesses believe 
The Catholic and I would say Christian mainstream evangelical belief is that Jesus is a piece. He's one third of the one God. He's God, he's eternal, but he's part of the three sections of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the Catholic belief. Some Seventh-day Adventist pioneers say that there was a point when Jesus was not, but he sprang forth from Jehovah, but both were before any creation existed. Jesus is begotten of God, but he is also God. I would say that is, uh, you're reaching for that. I'm not even saying that that's necessarily a problem. As long as you believe Jesus is God, it's not really an issue with me. But that's a reach to say that. Paul, you want to you add something? Well, we're told in multiple places in the Bible that all that was created was created through him and by him. And for so him. That, yes, and for him because it pleased the Father. But we don't know how many eons ago that is. And begotten Son of God it's his Father because as man, who is our Father spiritually? So Jesus cannot be our elder brother as a man. He cannot be our example if in that case he, God is not his Father. That would make Jesus God while he was here. Because yes. Paul says even though it would not be robbery for him to claim to be even equal with God, right. he humbled himself, came here. And he called God his father because he's our elder brother in this aspect. It's yes. the plan of salvation. That's yes. all you need to understand. Yes. But everything was created by him. I don't comprehend that. Yes. Nor will I try and put that into words other than what Paul says. Yes. And the spirit of prophecy. Absolutely. Paul, I just love that. Paul just hit the nail on the head. Jesus, the context matters, right? Yeah. Jesus being called the begotten of the Father, it's really symbolizing his work here on earth. Yeah. And he was an example, right? He couldn't be like, well, I'm God, but, you know, I'm going to, you know, show you guys that you can worship God, but I'm equal to him. So you can you know. he didn't do stuff like that, right? He, he made it very clear and plain. And so he can call himself our elder brother, not because he's not fully God, but because he is fully God, but he's also fully man. And he'll always be a man forever. You understand that? I'm not saying I'm not diminishing his divinity. Don't misunderstand. People misunderstand that. No, he's fully God. He's equal to God. But he's also fully man. And he's fully man for all of eternity. Do you realize that the Father, when he gave his son to this earth, he gave his son to humanity. Jesus was not a man, but he became a man. And he died on a cross, and when he was resurrected, he was resurrected as a man. And he will be a man, a human, for all of eternity. God, the Father, literally gave us humanity, his son. <laughs> That's amazing to me. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, and then 13 through 14, continuing with our study here. It says, in the beginning was the Word. That's really that, what Paul was talking about. It's, 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 it's the beginning. What's the beginning? The beginning is the wherever starting point is, which is the all of eternity. We don't know when it is. But it says, in the beginning was the Word. Jesus is the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. So Jesus is not created, okay? All things were made by him, by Jesus. And without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus is not made either. Jesus is not created. I would go as far as to say he's not begotten in that same sense that we would use it for our own children. And then verse 13 and 14, it says, which were born, and he's talking about his humanity now, which were born not of, of blood nor of the will of the flesh, so not by evolution, folks, the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, one thing needs to be understood. John, did, he, did, did John view the full glory of the Father?
did John. You had Peter, James, and John, the apostles, right? The disciples. Did they view, did they view the glory of the Father in Jesus Christ? You could say yes, you could say no. If you were to say yes, you'd probably be referencing the Mount of Transfiguration where he was glorified. But the reality is the Father dwells in light un unapproachable. So this statement is not true in the literal sense. It says, we beheld his glory. That's the glory of Jesus. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Well, you can't, you can't view the glory of the Father and live as a human being. You can't. So is, what is this talking about? This is talking about something spiritual, right? This is talking about the character of God. God's character was seen in Jesus Christ. And whose character did Jesus have? He had the character of the Father, begotten of the Father. So we need to think about these things spiritual because that, that truth matters so much more than whether he's begotten or not. Paul? And again, with that situation, you have, uh, I mean, just a realm of different uh, issues in the fact that Moses wanted to see Christ. Right. And yeah. what did he do? He had to cover him with his hand when he passed by, mm -hmm. and he could only gaze for what he could see at his back. But yet, you could, get, you could, you could feel, touch, look at him when right. he came here as a man. And this is an issue that we and the angels and the other creations are going to study all through eternity. Absolutely. So what you're dealing with here is the mind of God, which is infinite. And we, a puny little brain-damaged humans, I want to ex give right. these stupid explanations. Right. Really. Absolutely. So you have a bunch of things going on. Look at Moses, and then what did the apostles see? Yeah. Totally different. Absolutely. 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 Actually, the Bible, it seems to go from, from trying to get away from the physical thing the entire time. The further you go through, the further you go through, it's, it's saying, stop looking at the physical. It's just screaming at the top of his lungs by the time you get to the end. But yeah, that's what, but people, again, this, this sermon, uh, I'm not necessarily really taking a side. I'm taking a small side here. Uh, but what I'm really saying is this stuff shouldn't matter to us, uh, whether or not Jesus is, there was a time when he wasn't or was. I, I, like I said, I don't really have an issue with that as long as you still believe that Jesus is God and that he died for your sins. But to, uh, there's, people, there's people out there, I know it's hard to believe, <laughs> or maybe it's not hard to believe, <laughs> but there's people out there where this is all they care about. And I've even told them, I've challenged them, I said, do you, do you ever give the three angels messages? Or do you pass out pamphlets about this? And they'll say, well, no, but the reality is they're not doing anything, most likely. So, by him and for him, Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 through 17, we get some more information about Jesus and who he really is. It says, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible. So that means the actual visible things that we see, but then the other invisible things that we don't see, like math, like science and, and chemistry, like the laws of physics. All those things we don't, we don't see, but they were all created by him. Whether they be thrones or dominions, even positions, or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So not only does he create all things, visible and invisible, but he actually maintains everything. Amen. Even us. We live in, in him, we live and move and have our being. That's true. He's the one who keeps us alive. It's his breath that's in us. There's something called the God particle. Have you ever heard of it? A lot of atheists can't explain this, but when they look at an atom and what's going on in an atom, the positive and negative charges should make it explode. But for some reason it doesn't. There's something that holds it together. And they don't know what it is. They call it the God particle. So our whole body is made up of atoms. 
what happens, what happens when God, when we, if we're rebellious enough and God finally steps away and says, okay, you don't want me? And he steps away. What's going to happen? If he's holding us together, literally, if it's his breath that's in us, what happens? An explosion. Something similar probably to the lake of fire. Is that what's really happening on the lake of fire? Who knows? I don't know. I'm not going to speculate further than that. Paul? Well, I'm going to make one more comment. By him and for him also means that cross. So you could say he created his own destruction so that we can have salvation. What kind of a God is this? Yeah. By him and for him, Jesus is responsible for that cross. Amen. Amen. And he did that to show not only how much he loves us, but that the law can't be done away with either. John chapter 8, verses 58, it says, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am, using the same, using the same name given by God in Exodus, I am. Jesus said that. Actually, they almost stoned him at that point because he said that, because he said he was God. Mark chapter 14, it says, But he, beheld his, uh, he, but he held his peace, and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. He is God. So, and my point is by this, we have to understand Christ in the way that he's revealed himself to us. He says he's eternal. He says, actually, he received worship from people, too. You can find that in the Gospels. People worshiped him, and he did not correct them. Other places in the Bible, you see, when, when, whether it's Daniel or John, you see, you see him drop down to worship the angel because of the great vision that they were given. And they say, see thou, do it not. I'm a created being, too. But Jesus, when he's worshiped, he doesn't correct them because it needs no correction. So... My point is here that we have to understand who Jesus is in the way that he's revealed himself to us. He says he's God, not created. Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, it says, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. You can, you, this is a dual application. This is David talking about not only himself, but he's talking about, in a prophetic sense, the Son of God. So, the Lord, which is Jehovah, hath said to me, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. Is God, is God the Father, did God the Father beget David? No, his father's name is Jesse. And actually, he's the, he's the seventh son, the sixth of the seventh son. can't remember right now, but he's one, of the, he's one of the youngest sons. So what does this mean? This means spiritually speaking, right? This day have I begotten thee. You are preeminent now. You are my son. In the same way, this can be applied to Jesus Christ in his, in his human sense, right? When he, when he was baptized at his baptism and the Holy Spirit descended upon him, and he received his commission for his ministry, God opened up the clouds and he said, Behold my beloved son. So he was begetting him at that time. So it means, it doesn't just mean actual, we focus on the, again, we're focused on the physical. It means spiritual preeminence as well. That's why Jesus is called the first fruits, right? It's not because he's a created being. It's because that's the preeminence that he has. He's the first fruits of them that are saved. Exodus chapter 4, verses 22 and 23, it says, And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Right? There's many other nations besides Israel, whether you're looking at the literal Israel, who was a person whose, whose father was Isaac, or if you're looking at the nation itself, Israel was not begotten by Jehovah. It's his firstborn, though, he's telling Pharaoh here. It means preeminent. It means preeminent. 
And I say unto thee, let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. And that's exactly what he had to do eventually. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 9, it says, They shall come with weeping and with supplications will I lead them and will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. It means preeminence. It doesn't mean literally speaking. All right? If you're going to apply that tactic, you've got to apply it everywhere. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 through 9, um, Paul alluded to this earlier. It says, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So Jesus, in his mind, he doesn't think that it's, it's, it's anything wrong with him to be equal with God. If I were to think that, would that be sinful? If I thought, you know, I'm probably equal to the Father. Oh yeah, that's, I mean, <laughs> that's, sal that's salvational, right? That's it. You're like, you're, that's, you got to repent for that one. Uh, or, or it's not just a difference of opinion, right? That's, that's breaking the law of God for someone to think that. But Jesus, whether you think he's begotten or created, this, this whole concept, the fact that he th would think that he's equal with God, unless it was true, would be sinful. And so it's not sinful in his case. And that's what the, the point the Apostle Paul's making. It goes on, it says, but made himself of no reputation, right? That's the role he took, the dynamic with the Father. He made himself of no reputation, reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found fashioned as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Jesus also has life in himself. John chapter 5, verses 25 through 27, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, notice the argument he's making, for as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Interesting. So Jesus has life in himself. John chapter 8, verse 17 through 18. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it up again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So, one of the things you got to understand is that when Jesus was crucified, he was being obedient unto death. He has life in himself. You can't kill God. Good luck trying. You can't kill something that is life. So when Jesus died and was laid in the tomb, do you realize that Jesus, when he stayed in that tomb for three days, he was staying in that tomb for three days in obedience to the Father. He had life. He could take his life up again at any moment. But he would not take up his life again by his own admonition. And that's why Mrs. White records that Gabriel came down and told him to arise because he, because Gabriel received the order from the Father to come down and to awaken Jesus. Jesus remained obedient in the grave, and he never would have rose up again had he had not been given permission, express permission from the Father, even though he had life in himself. That's an obedience we'll never understand. Here's what we know. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 34. Christ, the Word, the only begotten of God, was one with the Eternal Father. One in nature, in character, in purpose. Like, not a triune God, but another person. The only being that could enter into all the counsels and purposes of God. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. 
His going forths have been from old, from everlasting. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And the Son of God declares concerning himself, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way. Before his works of old, I was set up from everlasting. He was appointed, and when, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him, as one brought up with him, as one brought up with him. Almost like he's saying like he was his brother in a sense here. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22 through 30. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 63, explains a little bit more about Jesus and what really we should understand concerning, concerning who he is. Mrs. White says, In all the universe there was but one who could, in behalf of man, satisfy its claims. Talking about the law that's been broken. Since the divine law is as sacred as God himself, only one equal with God could make atonement for its transgression. None but Christ could redeem fallen man from the curse of the law and bring him again into harmony with heaven. Christ would take upon himself the guilt and shame of sin, sin so offensive to a holy God that it must separate the Father and his Son. Christ would reach to the depths of misery to rescue the ruined race. Did you catch that? Only one equal with God could make atonement for its transgression. In other words, only one equal with the law, only an eternal being, because the law is eternal, could fulfill uh, the, the perfect sacrifice. Mrs. White also records that angels, angels, when they found out that Jesus was going to do that, they prostrated themselves down at his feet and said, no, let me go, because they loved him so much. They said, let me go to earth and let me be the sacrifice. Well, number one, I don't think that they probably would have passed the same temptations as Christ, but even if they did, their life was given to them from God. Their life is not their own, just like our life is not our own. We owe God, we owe God for the, our very existence, right? Mrs. White says very often, we, we, are God, we, are, we are gods by creation and redemption. So we're twice paid for not only did he create us, but after we had fallen, he redeemed us again. So we, are, we, he, we owe our life to him twofold and many more times over. Whereas an angel, that's, that's the, they're in a very similar situation because an angel, they can't give something that's not theirs because their life was given to them by God. It's not theirs to just give away. Jesus had life in himself. He's an eternal being. He has authority. He doesn't owe his life to anybody, right? Which to me settles the begotten versus created versus Godhead uh, question in him. Jesus did have life in himself. He did have authority over his own life. And so he could be that perfect sacrifice and no one else could. This is uh, from Manuscript Releases, Volume uh, 13, Numbers 100, uh, or sorry, 1000 through uh, 1080, page 19. Listen to what it has to say about the mind of Christ here. These words are not addressed to any human being except to the Son of the infinite God. Never in any way leave the slightest impression upon human minds that a taint of or inclination to corruption rested upon Christ or that he in any way yielded to corruption. He was tempted in all points like as man is tempted, yet he is called that holy thing. It is a mystery that is left unexplained, so we shouldn't comment on it, to mortals that Christ could be tempted in all points like as we are and yet be without sin. The incarnation of Christ has ever been and will ever remain a mystery. That which is revealed is for us and for our children, but let every human being be warned from the ground of making Christ altogether human, such as one as, our, as of ourselves. For it cannot be the exact time when humanity blended with divinity, it is not necessary for us to know. We are to keep our feet on the rock, Christ Jesus as God revealed in humanity. 
This was a letter that she wrote to Elder Baker because he was focusing on, on Christ and the fact that he had a carnal nature, which is true. But what Christ, uh, though Christ had a carnal nature and he was tempted in all points in sin, just like as we are, and yet he, was, he showed that we can overcome in the same way he did, not with his own power, but with the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how he overcame, and we can do the same. His mind, however, his mind, his mind was not like ours. And the reason why, it's not that it couldn't have been like ours, it could have, but it wasn't. His mind was not like ours because Christ lived in such a state of connection with the Father that he essentially had a mind which was a, a cleansed temple at all times, a mind that was a righteousness by faith mind. He, he had the mind of somebody who had never been tainted by sin, even though, even though his human body had those same lusts and desires that we all have. His mind was different, and that was because of his connection with God. And he showed us, not only did he show us, we, we can't make him altogether too human because of that, but, but even that aside, he showed us that we can have a righteousness by faith mind as well by keeping that same connection with the Father as he kept. In, uh, in closing, I have two more slides. This is a second to last one. These are my words. The reality is Jesus Christ is, in his humanity, is the only truly begotten Son of God. And I'm talking about in his humanity. He's the only truly begotten Son of God and man to ever exist. He's the only one from the human family that was tempted in every way yet never sinned. He did not use his divine power to accomplish victory over sin. He relied on the Father and the Holy Spirit to overcome for provision, for his miracles, and was obedient to death. Even Bible titans like Abraham, Joseph, Moses, Daniel, John the Baptist do not even come close to what Jesus accomplished or who he truly was in relation to God. He stands without a peer. He reconciled God and humanity, grasping the divine throne with one arm, with his divine arm, and the dregs, the lowest dregs of earth and humanity with his human arm, and united them together, just like Jacob's ladder. He is God's gift to humanity. He is the son of God, and he's our son, too. He's the son of man. Jesus said that over and over again. I am the son of man. He's our gift. He's our sacrifice. He's our savior. He's our, el he's our elder brother. He's our hope in time of need. He's even the one who chastises us when we are out of line. He's everything. He's our judge. And Mrs. White will close with this from Desire of Ages, page 25 and 26. One of the most powerful quotes in Desire of Ages, in my opinion. It says, By his life and his death, Christ has achieved even more than recovery from the ruin wrought through sin. It was Satan's purpose to bring about an eternal separation between God and man, but in Christ we become more closely united to God than if we had never fallen. In taking our nature... The Savior has bound himself to humanity by a tie that is never to be broken. Through the eternal ages, he is linked with us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, John 3.16. He gave him not only to bear our sins and to die as our sacrifice. He gave him to the fallen race to assure us of his immutable counsel of peace. God gave his only begotten son to become one with the human family forever to retain his human nature. This is the pledge that God will fulfill his word. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the God with us government shall be upon his shoulder. God has adopted human nature in the person of his son and has carried the same into the highest heaven. 
It is the Son of Man who shares the throne of the universe. It is the Son of Man whose name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. The I Am is the daysman between God and humanity, laying his hand upon both. He who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, is not ashamed to call us brethren. In Christ, the family of earth and the family of heaven are bound together. Christ glorified is our brother. Heaven is enshrined in humanity, and humanity is enfolded in the bosom of infinite love. What a gift. What a gift that sinful, wretched humanity, and the, the word is very clear, the wages of sin is death. Sinful, wretched humanity, an entire planet in rebellion against God. And not only did he forgive us when we deserved nothing but death, even if he left us to it, if he just left us to it, we'd destroy ourselves. But he gave us his son. And do you realize he elevated humanity to the throne of God when he did that? How much, how much value did he place upon each person when he decided to die for them? Someone who is worth all of eternity, who is infinite in value as Christ is. He has placed that same value by proxy on each and every one of us. What a gift. And he'll always be a human being for all of eternity. That's why he can't be in two places at once anymore. He's, he'll always be human. He's not like the Father and the Holy Spirit who can be in multiple places at the same time anymore because he has a human body now, over-encumbered with it. So we give thanks to God and we give thanks to His truth. May we focus on the things that matter, like His character, what He did for us, how He's the begotten of the Father as the Son of Man, how He's the begotten of the Father as the preeminent and not physically speaking. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you so much of the great sacrifice you made and giving, giving Jesus Christ to this rebellious race. Help us to trust in him as our savior. Send us, Father, your Son, again to this earth. Help us to be ready, to be prepared, to be overcomers, to receive the strength of the Holy Spirit, and to walk diligently with you, doing your will. Help us to follow you and help us to follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goes.